Welcome to my podcast series, Formidable Females in Future Flight. I'm a headhunter in this sector and I'm meeting with women from across the future of aviation and aerospace in order to inspire more women to consider this sector for their own careers. I'm delighted to be joined today by Sarah Ellaby, the CEO of a pioneering sustainable aviation fuel business, Nova Pangea Technologies. Sarah has recently returned to Teesside in the north of England from 18 years in the USA and a global career which she began as a professional athlete. Sarah, it's such a privilege to have you here today. How are you? I'm good, Joanne. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining us. And Sarah, you've really built your career almost exclusively in male-dominated industries. Mm-hmm. Could you begin with, could you just give us a, a little bit of a story about that? What, what has your career been up to now? Uh, well, well, as you know, I was a professional athlete for nearly twenty years. Uh, that's what uh, that's what took me to the US. Um, I've, I've I've been relatively sector agnostic. Um, I started out actually in sports entertainment. Uh, worked with some iconic brands such as Michael Jordan, uh, Mia Hamm. Uh, sort of, you know, working on strategic partnerships. Um, ran a, a fifty million pound, a fifty million dollar sports platform uh, within golf, uh, you know, LPGA and Champions Tour. Uh, progressed into healthcare, uh, which was uh, with a similar iconic brand, MD Anderson Cancer Centre. Uh, worked with uh, a large health system, which was Orlando Health. Uh, they have around about seven or eight hospitals within their system all the way from working from sort of uh, launching various uh, service divisions to uh, all the way to cross-border transaction uh, into into China. Um, Spent some time in life sciences as as a turnaround CEO. Uh, So worked um, worked in life sciences for some time, Um, was also the executive director of a, a, a cancer charity over in over in the states, and then I met uh, I met a guy called Honourable Robert Hansen, and Robert introduced me to the world of of natural resources and energy, very very traditional uh, sectors. And I remember Robert saying, you know, I think you really enjoy these sectors. You know, you you know, I think you really thrive in the in these sectors. And I thought to myself. Natural resources, oil and gas. Um, I can't think of anything worse, to be quite frank. But um, um, you know, here we are, sort of, you know, nearly I don't know, ten plus years down the road of being in these sectors. Um, but ultimately, it was Robert that introduced me to to sort of very traditional uh, sectors. And you know, it's not been an easy road. I had a sort of a gold mine in in the Yukon in the Tintinna Gold Belt. Uh, lots of stories to be told there. Um, I worked with a, law, a large sort of oil and gas portfolio in Canada. We had uh, assets in Fort Mac, 80,000 acres in Cabob Duvernay. Um, so, you know, natural resources, oil and gas. Then I went to natural gas distribution, uh, where I was a chief exec of a, uh, a technology uh, within within the sector where with a very large uh, distribution uh, network company, public company um, that basically adopted our sort of meter and regulator station for natural gas uh, distribution. Um, most of the sort of meter and regulator stations are quite are aging in the US and the need basically ch- changing out a lot of the methane emission over about 11 percent of natural gas distribution due to aging infrastructure. Um, And that was just before I decided to make the return journey back to where I was born and bred. Um, So, you know, 18 years over in in the US um, and now I'm now I'm back to where I was born and bred in in the UK. Lovely. If I was to write a story about an inspiring career, I'd actually (laughs) struggle to improve on yours. I wondered, what is it that led you to return to the UK and why have you chosen to do this now? Yeah, I spent twelve years with 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 uh, with Robert Hansen, and and you know from a finance and commercial perspective, he gave me great exposure uh, to some really really interesting sectors. 
and you know lots of shaping from a finance and commercial perspective really came from uh, working with Robert and I felt like 18 years over in in North America and obviously working having uh, various uh, tenures as well uh, you know beyond North America and doing some work in China I just thought that you know it was the right time to return and to bring my experience across business transformation, turnaround, scale up um, within these sectors. I really wanted to bring that experience network back to the northeast of England because what I what I saw in in the UK and when I started to think about you know is it time to move back was you know the UK is on the forefront of you know, technology development, development, innovation, net zero. I saw so many sort of renewable companies popping up. And I also thought that the UK had come quite, you know, had really progressed when it comes to financing. So there was building out of all of these ecosystems, regional ecosystems for finance. I thought, you know, when before I left, you had to go to London. Uh, to raise finance now that's not the case so I thought that um, you know again it's just bringing my experience back to the northeast really having creating a legacy and having impact but also seeing that there's so much innovation um, out of the UK that I really wanted to join the dots of finance and innovation because I think the UK like I said is really good at innovating um, but I think sometimes it's still got some way to go before, you know, to, to get to a point where it can actually finance uh, the, these innovations. Um, so that's sort of what brought brought me back to the UK. Brilliant. Fundamentally, to, to make an impact, to yeah. utilise all those skills, experience and, and contacts and yeah. um, and bring um, some some really strong um, impact to to the area like you say that you you're from yeah. um could you tell me a little bit more about the the business that you've joined nova pangea technologies what's unique about about the business and what are you aiming to do uh, mm. uh, well we are so that was one of the reasons you know i looked at lots of different opportunities when uh thinking about returning back to the uk but this really had the the level of differentiation that i look for um you know, this is a technology that, um, you know, from my perspective, is an absolute game changer. We are, you know, a technology that will unlock sustainable aviation fuel or 2G uh, sustainable aviation fuel um, in the UK and beyond. Um, and Nova, you know, Nova, Nova Pangea has this, a, a ref, it's called the RefNova technology. It takes sort of woody what I call lignocellulosic residues and waste. So we look at sort of woody residues, sawmill residues, uh, various uh, wood waste, um, all the way through to agricultural residues such as wheat straw, uh, sugarcane, bagasse. Um, and we, we take that through our, a, an initial sort of particle size reduction, um, acid impregnation, and then drying step. So a relatively simple pretreatment step. Once it gets to a certain particle size, our steam-assisted rapid pyrolysis, our SARP IP, a linear reactor, it converts these various feedstocks that we use into two products. Um, it's not one, one product and one byproduct. It's two, two, two products. We call it Novachar. The sugars are then fermented into 2G ethanol, the catalyst uh, to unlock 2G staff. The biochar is a really, really exciting proposition. An ultimate, you know, instant sort of carbon sequestration or carbon removal mechanism. This is an actual natural solution to carbon removal. You know, if you utilise biochar as a soil enhancer, um, you know, we have the ability to deliver a carbon negative, a carbon negative fuel. So, you know, this, this Nova checked all the boxes for me. It has a highly differentiated technology. It has the, the ability to catalyze 2G SAF. It's a, a right here and right now solution to carbon removal. Um, so from an impact perspective, it has it all. Um, so I was really excited to join uh, NPT when the 
demonstration facility at Wilton International had just been built. Uh, we've run through commissioning and now we're looking to deliver our first uh, first of a kind commercial facility here at Wilton International. Um, we've got a really exciting partnership with British Airways to deliver just over 100 million litres of SAF. So that's Project, Project Speedbird. It's a really exciting time for the business, um, for the region and for the UK. Brilliant. And um, these are extremely bold and ambitious goals um, with some really incredible um, outcomes. Do you think there'll be any particular challenges that you'll face on this journey? Yes, lots of challenges, uh, Joanne. This, uh, in the US, you know, the US is, a, is a, a very mature ecosystem when it comes to uh, sort of ethanol production or capital intensive businesses, big capital projects. You know, we are building a chemical facility. The UK has been a real struggle to, to, to obtain finance. It's a more mature ecosystem uh, for capital intensive businesses in the US. To get these projects online, it, it, it's not the, the check size that's required goes beyond venture capital. Um, it's, it's, it's into institutional strategic infrastructure funds. The underlying issue for the UK right now is, you know, venture capitalists, they don't, the check size is too great for them. Um, the, the risk profile is there, that matches with venture. Um, but ultimately, the scale and the requirement from an investment perspective goes beyond venture. So this is a struggle across the industry. It's not just Nova Pangea. It's all projects that are looking to scale up uh, and deliver SAF in the UK. We're all constantly trying to raise finance to get to an actual decision point of investment. Uh, we need pre, you know, basically pre-fid development investment. I, I speak at various sort of conferences and events, and you know, we're a year on, and we're we, we do, we're saying saying great things, but we're not really seeing the action. So it's go the financiers such as you know infrastructure funds institutional investors are going to have to make some adjustment to their risk criteria in order to get these projects funded or else we 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 will see tremendous delays that point at which you decided okay the the landscape seems to have matured it's a good time to return to the UK actually you've perhaps found that it is maybe more challenging than you imagined um, fundraising in the UK it, it sounds as though it's actually quite a lot more difficult to get a business like this off the ground in the UK versus the USA it's, it's so much harder I think you know it, it's not it goes beyond finance uh, the government need to provide you know, clarity in re in regard to the SAF mandate, it pricing mechanisms. We have to understand that this is a new industry, new industry, new technology, new framework required. And so there's going to be risk with these technologies scaling up to meet the SAF mandate. We don't need five SAF plants. We need facilities in, in the UK just to meet the mandate. What does it take to get these projects off the ground? Well, it takes people. And we're all with so many projects coming online, we're all fighting for the same talent. So it's a candidate market. So you need talent, you need people, you need investment, you need the government to signpost and signal, provide clarity in regard to uh, the, the, the mandates. Um, you know, but, you know, you also need sort of EPCs, access to EPCs, as what was highlighted in the Philip New report. Um, you know, the EPCs are stretched because there's so many projects coming online. In fact, if you're if you're considering building a what we call a, a ranch style plant or a stick build, um, you will it you will see delays. You've got to you've got to move to a modular design and some prefabrication or else um you, your project will be delayed. It's resource, it's EPC. It's the design of the facility. It takes a, a, a village to build these facilities. We all need to sort of come together and collaborate in order for this to, to for these projects to get off the ground.
Yeah. So who specifically do you think needs to collaborate in order for for your business and, and others like it to really be set up for success? What do you think needs to happen um, by by the government and its agencies and also by by industry? There's a few things that it, within government. I think there's too many silos, various you know, like DEFRA, the Environmental Agency, the, the you know, all of these these departments need to talk to each other uh, because I think it's very frustrating one when one says one thing and the other is contradicting the other. Um, so that I, I really want to see the silos broken down within government. Um, like I said, I think we've got a tremendous opportunity. I think there's a great opportunity uh, for funders to really deploy significant capital uh, within this within this industry um, I think that um, collaboration so that's going to take private public and private sector coming together we've got to come together um, and I think you know when it comes to investment you know the venture funds you know perhaps need to um, partner with the strategics from a technical perspective so they've they've got that technical expertise because a lot of these you've got to remember this again this is a new industry uh, and it's it's complex right so so you know funders need to get you get comfortable with this so I think collaborating with other sort of strategics or strategics that have really good technical teams policy teams that's what's required really it's a it's a holding of hands with private and public sector and spreading i suppose the risk profile across um to be able to get to move these projects forward because you know we're a year in i spoke at argus uh, the argus conference last year and i'm saying the same things i said the same things last week at, at, in madrid there's a lot of talking but there isn't the action that's required yeah yeah but actually, it sounds like potentially there's um, there is, as you say, a really good opportunity for investors and, and good timing when we look at the aviation industry opening back up alongside um, an increased awareness and, and demand for uh, for sustainability. Um, mm -hmm. That actually, if we get the basics right, then uh, then now is a, a great time for this industry. And um, you mentioned already one really exciting partnership um that you have um project speedbirds with british airways could mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit more about that yeah no absolutely from the investment perspective we mm -hmm. received uh investment from ieg from the parent company of british airways um uh, a few months ago so you know we're very excited to have ieg as part of our uh, sort of uh, our share register um, Project Speedbird is, you know, is a a really really exciting uh, project for the UK. Not only are we de delivering 100 million tons of SAF per year, we, you know, of course that's th through the partnership with Landerjet. So we we will produce the 2G ethanol. Um, Landerjet will then convert that to 2G SAF. The whole carbon removal profile of uh, Project Speedbird is really, really exciting because, of course, we've got this uh, biochar, uh, which is a na natural carbon sequestration, carbon removal mechanism. The emissions uh, savings from Project Speedbird will be the sort of the equivalent to 26,000 domestic British Airways flights uh, in, in the UK. Um, this is a, like I said, this is a a really exciting multi-site there will most likely be a centralized alcohol to jet facility but our our refnova plants will be at various uh, various sites throughout the uk so where it's called a hub and spoke um mm -hmm. so a centralized alcohol to jet and then basically the spokes which is refnova will be placed either close to feedstock close to utilities uh, and then we'll basically transport um, either sugars or the ethanol into into that centralised. You know, we we anticipate um, the alcohol to jet facility being online in twenty twenty six. Uh, you know, the end of twenty twenty six, we're starting to put a shovel in the ground, uh, depending on sort of planning 
um, you know, for uh, our Nova Nova One, uh, which will most likely be this. We're hoping it, it's this year. We've seen some delays, but most, you know, that's that's centering around the financing uh, in in the UK. Um, but we should be we'll scale up because uh, our our requirement is about 190 million liters of of ethanol per year. Uh, so we'll scale up over you know a, a set period of time and should be at sort of full production by 2027 2028 uh, depending on depending on on financing so you know speedbirds a fantastic uh flagship uh project for the for the UK alongside the the financing it's a, a win-win to to actually achieve a, a carbon negative fuel and, and obviously you'll you'll need money in order to to do that is there anything else that you need in this technology is is going to create a, a lot of jobs is there anything else that you need from outside of the business in order to facilitate this scale up i've been with the company since uh, january 2020 and over the last sort of three to four years where i've been with the company we've been you know fine-tuning the technology commissioning building from a commercial perspective now that you know we're, we're still you know we've gone through fells and feed studies where obviously moving to site preparation site strip laying concrete um, moving into detail design once you get to that sort of delivery and execution phase you need to look at you know what's needed for that delivery execution phase over the next sort of three to five years all right so because these plants take some time to to build and you know, for this phase, you need to, you know, you need to look at so reorganization, restructuring the company, preparing the company for significant amount of investment, um, building out the capability and the breadth of the team. Uh, so building out what I'm doing right now is looking at sort of the operating model, the whole resourcing that will underpin and deliver the operating model. Um, building out the exec team and laying the foundation for that delivery execution and growth. Um, and that's quite an undertaking because it goes beyond uh, just building, you know, one facility. We're building one facility and then we've got multi-site delivery and you've got to think about, you know, the whole IT and infrastructure that's required. So it's it's people, it's systems, it's processes. It's, you know, making sure you've got a structure that's investable and, and ready for investment, um, making sure that you've got the skills within the company and the capabilities. Can't go out there and run that and run that plan. We are reskilling, upskilling um, and, and making sure that we've got the right capability uh, for that sort of that delivery and execution phase, because it is a completely different phase. There's a lot of work that goes into the preparation to be able to execute on multi-site delivery. So, you know, investment, people, uh, you know, reskilling, upskilling, major recruitment, lots of recruitment, constantly recruiting. Uh, but again, it's it's a competitive market because there's so many projects coming online. Everybody's fighting for the same, you know, fighting for the same talent. So. It's not for the faint-hearted, um, but it's but it's a very very exciting time of the business for sure. Very rewarding to get these projects off the ground uh, in the place that you're from, and and although there is intense talent, uh, there's intense competition for talent. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's also a high demand for jobs, and I think that piece about reskilling and upskilling, actually investing in people, um, that's the thing that's that's really going to make a difference to the the lives of people in the local community as a fellow northerner i um i really share your your passion and um, and enthusiasm for, mm -hmm. for bringing this project home what you're really passionate about is is diversity and how you've found building your career as a female since making that transition into the energy sector is there anything that you as a business are, are doing already to encourage more women and other diverse or underrepresented individuals to join or or progress their career in this industry when i joined one of the first things that 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 i started was a one-year placement 
uh, programme, which is in its third or fourth year now. The first placement, one year placement was actually female, a chemical engineer uh, out of Bath. Um, and we've just continued to build on that programme. So I'm a big believer in promoting females within STEM. I think it's absolutely critical. Um, you know, this is a really interesting industry, but I do. I love, you know, I love what we're trying to do. It's hard. It's really, really hard. And I think it's, it's you know, it's, it, it's not for the faint hearted. But um, again, what I realized very early on is, and I've always, uh, I know my strengths and weaknesses, and I'm high, I'm, I've got a high level of self awareness. And I just, I love information, I love to learn. And I, I will always say to the, the placements, just when you come into the business, you're going to get exposure. It's not like a your, your uh, sort of regular sort of standalone one year placement. They get access to, you know, they, they spend time with me. You know, they, they get really interesting projects. They'll sort of be cross-functional. So they'll see ex every aspect of the business. Sometimes they get board exposure. Um, so I'm... I really want to give junior engineers or, um, you, know, you know, even post-grad the opportunity to come into a business and learn as much as what they possibly can. Um, and, you know, I think that um, it, it's all also important from a standpoint is I'm trying to get a, an equal balance within the business, but you've got to earn it. Uh, it you know, you've got to earn it. So, um, and, and the team know that. So, I'm very, very passionate about promoting females in STEM. I think it's required. I think it's a great industry uh, to work in. But again, it's got its challenges in traditional uh, industry. But you know, be very, very self-aware um, and know your strengths and weaknesses. Learn as much as you can. Soak it up like a sponge. Know your, you know, really have strong knowledge um, and, um, you know, whatever subject matter you're talking about um, and build your network. And, and again, if you don't, if you don't ask, you won't get. I'm a, you know, I, I, I've always been since I was, I don't know, a teenager. Um, I've always asked and I've all and, and generally, uh, you know, I've, I've been quite successful with, <laughs> uh, with, with my ass. So don't be afraid to ask. And don't be afraid to have a go because, you know, that, that's just ultimately what I've done over my career. Never been afraid to have a go at something, even though it's difficult. Um, you know, that's something that um, Robert has always said is loved my drive and tenacity. And I grind it out, basically, until I get the job done. Brilliant. Well, that is uh such good advice always to ask and it, it sounds as though you've got um a really fantastic um mentor and ally in in robert who's mm -hmm. um encouraged the the career transition that that you made um all of those years ago and um and then i i'm sure also been a a really supporting influence throughout um it's been such an a pleasure to meet with you today thank you so much for making time mm -hmm. and um i'm sure that this story will, will really really resonate with with people that listen to it so thank you so much for for joining me today sarah thanks joanne